Sea God Origins, Lovecraftian monster who turns humans into his tentacle thralls, explored. It is fascinating to see how Kentaro Miura's concept of the astral world plays out in Berserk as his story progresses. Our introduction to this overlapping domain came in the very first chapter when we met Puck, an elf who is now Guts's main healing agent and jester. Over time, things get more intense as we go through apostles, trolls, ogres, kelpies, and even the God Hand. But as Flora explains, explained to the Black Swordsman party in her spirit tree mansion, trolls, elves and dead spirits only resided in the shallow layer of the astral world that we call the interstice. The realm itself was like the human subconscious given form, so as magi delved deeper within it with their luminous bodies, they came across strange landscapes and even stranger beings like angels, demons and gods of polytheism. We have seen an example of the former two working together through the vessel of the God Hand, particularly Femto, but that last one is something we'd never seen in Berserk before. A literal god from the astral world being manifested within the physical world sounds like a ghastly nightmare, and indeed that is how it felt when the occupants of the seahorse came across Isma's solitary island. The sea god is perhaps one of the oldest and definitely one of the strongest beings to have ever been in Berserk, and he gives you an idea of the sheer scale at which evil can exist in this world. So without delaying things any further, this is the Sea God's origins explored. And before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is one small click for you, but for us it means an awful lot. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Belief in the spiritual is the basis of his existence. How Flora explained the sea god's existence over a hundred chapters before he appeared. The concept of religion and faith only works as long as the one adhering to it completely believes in it. Just look at Father Mosgus. He thought his pseudo-apostle powers were God-given miracles and never once stopped to think of the rank atrocities he was promoting with his torturers because he truly believed it to be God's will. He probably still thinks that the swirling mass of tortured souls he he's become a part of is heaven, when in reality as a pseudo, his soul is destined for the hellish abyss. But Mosgus was a strict adherent of the Holy See and all its doctrines. This particular religion, which sprung up in the final moments of Supreme King Geyseric's dwindling continental empire, is much too orthodox for magic to have a place in it. Mosgus and Farnese had given many suspected heretics and their family members deaths that they believed were justified in the name of God. Yet it was also their faith that had blinded them to the world's true hidden mysteries, as Farnese say desperately clinging to her faith made her unable to see or perceive Puck, the main star of Berserk, according to him. We learn just why she was now able to see, touch and feel Puck's empath powers just as easily as she could see Shirka's magic working. It's because she had broadened her horizons and accepted the greater mysteries within her own mind without even realising it. After arising at Flora's spirit tree mansion, the Black Swordsman party learns a lot about the astral world that they never knew before and this is where our introduction to the sea god takes place. Shirka explains to her future comrades how they are able to perceive elves like Puck and Ivalera without any problems whatsoever. It's because they believed in those magical creatures. She goes on to explain that once all of humanity believed in elves but the Holy See's universal doctrine had put such a hard imposition on all things magical that it was all one could do to even see them these days. Puck immediately understands that this was why Farney couldn't see him before she was just too much of a believer or a non-believer depending on which side you pick. This prompts Trollmaster Isidro to say that if this is the case then people should just stop believing in evil things and they'd simply disappear. Shirka once again calls him vulgar for his ignorance and Puck just straight up attacks him for being so insensitive. Flora's disciple explains that there exists a thing called the collective subconscious which is shared by all of humanity and is the reason why elves and other astral creatures can never truly disappear. They're like the archetypes embedded deep within the human genetic code which can be unlocked with varying levels of belief. Flora then takes over and explains that for a long time the Magi have been inheriting and practicing the art of casting their luminous bodies to explore the astral world. This is why they were more in tune with its workings and how Flora knew the inner workings of this spiritual dimension. She explained that in the shallow layers of the astral world which we call the interstice many ethereal beings from legends across the world exist and because their domains are derived from the physical world usually a person cannot differentiate between them. This layer is also where the souls of those who died unwanted deaths or bore regret 
regret in their hearts in their final moments tend to linger, which is why Guts gets attacked by them so frequently in his early travels, far more than magical creatures. But as the person delved deeper into the astral world, the landscapes took on forms that could not be comprehended by human imagination. This was the realm where things like angels, demons and gods of polytheism existed, and we know this to be true instinctively because whenever you see the god hand, they're standing in one bizarre macabre wonderland or another. The first time they appeared in Berserk was in a place where geometry and gravity went for a toss. The second time was in a landscape populated by tortured human faces that felt suspiciously alive. It's safe to say that the sea god falls into this category of astral beings because, as its name suggests, it's a deity worshipped by a group of people, specifically the people of Isma's island, which is where all of our knowledge about this entity and its purpose comes from. So having explained to you what the sea god's existence signifies in astral terms, let's look at how he affected the physical world with his inhuman presence. The Seahorse vs Bonebeard Part 2 goes a bit different than before. The Sea God's introduction to Berserk. It's ironic that a malevolent Sea God is introduced to the story through quite possibly its most bizarre character, but Berserk wouldn't be Berserk without it. When Bonebeard is introduced to the story, people thought he was just a joke villain who was added to the story to show off the progress of many of its side characters like Isidro, Mule and Roderick. The former two practiced their swordplay with a stereotypical pirate on stable and unstable ground whilst the latter put an end to his mad revenge by sinking two of Bonebeard's ships with his massive man of war called Seahorse. Usually, such a decisive victory cuts off pursuit from even the meanest of pirates who would rather minimise losses than run straight into them, but Bonebeard remained defiant. Even with the crew of three ships aboard his captain Shark Rider, Bonebeard remained adamant about chasing down and killing Roderick. He didn't care if their bellies were empty and his men grew mutinous, he was going to keep going from rage and use the traitors as shark bait. When his first mate reminded him of all the spooky happenings at sea that had been occurring after the great roar of the astral world, Bonebeard simply rejected them as superstition. He had been a gentleman of fortune for close to 25 years, surely he'd have been haunted to death by now because of some of his actions, yet even as he gave his speech the very things he denied materialised behind him. Only those who were looking towards their captain caught a glimpse of those tentacle monsters lurking behind him, and what made them truly unsettling were their human-like faces. We don't find out how said faces introduced themselves to Bonebeard and his crew, but we know they did, because right after this Captain Shark Rider catches up with the seahorse, and something is definitely different about it. Shirka had pointed out earlier that it was as if the whole ship had become one inhuman thing, and that fact was proven when the ship submerged itself to avoid cannon fire from the seahorse. Roderick had already recognised its banners before it went under, but he couldn't believe what his eyes were seeing nonetheless when his seahorse narrowly avoided the Captain Shark Rider. Bonebeard's crew were not turning their fire, instead it was as if the entire vessel was a ghost ship. Shirka even sensed a wicked odd coming off the Captain Shark Rider as if the whole thing had become one dreadful entity, and that's when Captain Bonebeard emerged, noting her sharpness. He boastfully greeted Roderick and was eager to take on the Sailing Prince when he realised that the same guys who ran him out of Rattanus were aboard his vessel. Bonebeard fell into a comical spiral, recounting his own efforts to go straight by retiring from piracy and becoming an honest slave trader. He'd have gotten away with the two were not for these meddling kids, and for a second the pirate turns into a Scooby-Doo villain before recovering and returning to the world of Berserk and announcing that he and his crew had also retired from being human. Dozens of fleshy, toothed tentacles shot up from the waters and stared at Roderick's sailors with their sad little eyes. His sailors had been getting premonitions of something evil lurking within the tides for days since the great roar of the astral world, and it had finally culminated in this absurd, Kraken-esque being rising from the deeps. We call it Kraken like, because no myth has ever told us that a kraken's tentacles can eat people as well, and yet that is exactly what happens here. Bonebeard commands his hearties to feast on the seahorse's crew to their heart's desire, and before they can clear the deck of humans, Guts arrives chopping up tentacles for tentative breakfast. His dragon slayer slashed up to at least six tentacles in the two blows he landed as wake-up practice, and it was after that he asked the crew to hit the decks. He slashed his way through the tentacles, impressing everyone, including Bonebeard, who ended up summoning the thing whose whiskers Guts was tearing off a massive, hydra-like mutant sea serpent. 
Bonebeard was sure this was going to work as there was no way Guts could kill something this massive, right? Well, the Black Swordsman used the trick he picked up fighting against Rosine's apostles and blasted his arm cannon into the Hydra thing's mouth while slashing it open with Dragon Slayer thanks to the recoil. Bonebeard remained adamant about attacking the Black Swordsman and ended things there and then, but the sun had started coming up so he and his crew disappeared underneath the waves. Though none of them knew it yet, this was the first encounter that Guts and his party had with the infamous Sea God of Isma's Island. Following the great roar of the astral world and the advent of Fantasia, Guts's brand of sacrifice had not stopped bleeding because he was now in a perpetual interstice. This also meant that every spiritual being that was trapped within the astral world also manifested into the physical world alongside all sorts of creatures from legend. The sea god was one of these legends and we learnt of his existence only because Isidro went exploring. It is an ancient deity that only Shirka and Isma are aware of the sea god of Isma's island. A little bit of legwork on the small dismal island leads Isidro and Puck to the mouth of a mysterious cave. At around the same time, Guts and Shirka's group come across a strange idol that the people of the island seem to worship. It looks like a cyclops with a tentacle beard, not unlike Cthulhu from Lovecraftian mythos. Shirka informs the group that this is an ancient deity who was forgotten by times as the Holy See's influence took over almost at the same time that Isma updates Isidro of the sea god's malevolent nature. This ancient being apparently did only two things. One, sink ships, and two, eat people. Shirka goes looking for the sea god herself and realises that the tentacle beings must be extensions of his. She gets the full story when she shows up at Isma's with the salamander dagger Isidro dropped and a nostril full of seawater. When she inquires about the island's mysterious and wicked odd in her own way, Isma reveals that many years ago there lived a sea god in this part of the ocean. This god was no benevolent deity. Like Charbdis from Greek mythology, it would devour all things moving in its way, ships, humans, even the fishes. Before long, the sea became a tide that only carried death upon its waves. This was when the Meros decided to stand up to the malevolent deity and end its gluttonous tirade. Their war lasted a very long time and the benevolent sea spirits lost many of their kin, but in the end, they were able to defeat the sea god and confine it to the cave on the island. Eventually, the fish and even people returned to the remote corner of the the world, but the Ancient One's power was too strong to be contained entirely. On full moons, it would stretch out its terrible tendrils and send them forth to attack and devour anything that came in their path, living or otherwise. And Isma had noted another peculiar thing about her island of late. Ever since the great wind passed through the world, the people had become even more isolated than before. She was used to them turning their backs on her given that she was the village outcast, but now it was as if they'd lost all interest in the outside world. We find out the reason behind this is the sea god itself. You see, Isma might have joked about it in her conversation with Shirka and Isidro, but she was actually a Mero. Her father, a human, had mated with the Mero of the sea and been blessed with her life. But before he could raise her proper, he passed away, and Isma never knew her mother. The only thing that she had to remind her of her parents were the charms and trinkets they left adorning Isma's home, which turn out to be the reason she's alive. Because the rest of her village has been devoured and assimilated by the sea god. And because Guts and Co. had the misfortune of arriving during a full full moon, they were now going to become sacrificial offerings for the forgotten myth, so nothing new by their standards. But this encounter between the Black Swordsman party and this malevolent sea god was practically proof that such divine spiritual beings did once exist in the physical world. The sea god was probably a manifestation of humanity's fear of the sea, because we know that most things in Berserk exist because humans used to, up to a point, believe in them. Isma dislikes her villagers not just because they treat her like an outsider, but also because despite being saved by the Meros, they remained ungrateful to them. They instead chose to revere the sea god to avoid falling prey to its wrath, but they must not have realised that an evil being remains evil, even in dormancy, because now they had all become part of the sea god's tentacle army. No matter how many of them Guts, Roderick and Serpico cut down, more would keep replacing them, and eventually even Bonebeard showed up for the party, carrying gigantic, monstrous sea slugs with him. He attacked Black Swordsman's party with his new brethren, who were all human at one point in their lives, and and this onslaught was enough to push Guts to rely on the Berserker armour. The only thing that stopped Guts's savage assault was the Moonlight Child and later Shirka exploiting the opening created by him. The crew of the seahorse that had come ashore with Roderick was of a mind to make quick repairs and depart with haste, but the Black Swordsman knew the Sea God would not let up so easily. He proposed that they settle the fight at Isma's Island before departing, and the crew agrees. After setting up defences for the seahorse, thanks to 
Farnese using the four elemental kings formation for the first time, Guts and Shirka ventured towards the cave where the sea god dwelt to beard it in its cage, but neither of them were prepared for the sheer scale of this thing. It's basically an underwater version of Ganishka's Shiva form, the Black Swordsman versus the Sea God. When Shirka and Guts, in his controlled berserker state, arrive at the mouth of the cave, both of them can instinctively sense this was going to be far more difficult than anything they had faced during daylight. Guts's brand of sacrifice began bleeding profusely when he reached the cave, which tells us that the Apostles and the God Hand aren't the only things it reacts to. Any kind of malevolent evil spirit or deity comes in close proximity of the brand of sacrifice will make it bleed like a leaking faucet. That, coupled with the fact that the sea god was now awake and this full moon signified his Easter, the word tough didn't even begin to cut it. No sooner had they crossed a fallen protective statue of some kind or a visage of the sea god as a human that they were set upon by his man-eating slug tentacles. Bonebeard emerged from the sea of flesh as well and welcomed the pair to his humble abode, telling them that they were absolutely screwed now that they'd walked into the sea god's shrine. And that's because the sea god himself was unfathomably huge. It turns out our whiskers analogy earlier on was spot on. Most of the tentacle monster we see during the entire journey to and off Isma's island are all basically a part of the sea god's beard. Its maw itself is so massive that it probably covers all of Isma's island and there was no telling how deep its body actually ran. When the sea god roared, even Shirka freaked out by its overwhelming spiritual pressure and the oncoming horde of tentacle monsters preparing to devour guts. But the black swordsman remained calm. Shirka asked him to retreat to a bottleneck if possible and take out the tentacles one by one, but Guts told her they were going to kill it inside out by leaping into its mouth. With one swift movement, the black swordsman propelled himself towards the sea god's gaping maw and mowed down any tentacles blocking his path. Bonebeard's crew thought he was insane for doing this, but the man himself couldn't care any less. He was ecstatic at Guts's futile sacrifice and moved the rest of his brethren towards the seahorse, looking to exact his revenge from the sailing prince of Egypt. What he didn't realise is that this is what Guts was aiming for because his plan was simple. If you can't kill it from the outside, do it from the inside. The Black Swordsman arrives in the Sea God's stomach and discovers that this thing has been dragging in ships and making their crews part of itself for centuries. Shirka wants him to cut through the being's stomach lining and make his way to its heart, but Guts has a better idea. He was just going to let the Sea God's stomach acid carry him to the top of his organ where he had a better vantage point to cut through. In order to get there, Guts started jumping around the ship graveyard, avoiding gushers of acid as best he could, whilst fighting off parasites that lived in the sea god's stomach. Meanwhile, the seahorse was being set upon by Bonebeard and scores of those nasty sea slugs, and the only things keeping it afloat were Roderick's quick actions and Farnese's four kings formation. The slugs, being purely astral entities, could not enter the formation, but Bonebeard's ship could, as it was a physical object. The seahorse crew, led by Isidro's defiant speech about Bonebeard being a fruit of the sea, whatever that means means, made its counter-attack and managed to beat the tentacle pirate at his own game. While all of this is going on outside, Guts had found a way to make it to the next level of the sea god's body. Leaping off a collapsing mast, Guts drove Dragon Slayer deep into the point Shirka had shown him earlier and the gamble paid off. Instead of falling into the acid below, he was sucked into the cavity above by the air pressure generated through the hole he had made. He continued fighting the parasites and symbiotes that lived within sea god, the latter having cut a deal to receive nourishment in exchange for providing protection. All sorts of negotiations fell flat in front of the Black Swordsman's blade, however, and Guts easily makes his way to the Sea God's heart, which is where things start to get tricky. The Sea God was a massive entity whose size was comparable to Ganishka in his Shiva form. Naturally, all his organs were going to be supersized, and while you think that makes it an easy target, you're not taking into account the environmental factors at play. What is the heart's primary function? It's to pump blood through your body, right? That circulation process requires it to beat at regular intervals so that we stay alive alive, but the vibrations and the kinetic energy generated by a human heart is not so significant that it can deafen and blind people. The vibrations and the kinetic energy generated by the sea god's heart is. The chamber where its existential essence could be found was like the ocean bed. It was aqueous, which allowed the booming heart of the sea god to nearly paralyse guts the first time round. To top it off, the kaiju protecting its heart was far bigger and more malign than the ones he'd fought on his way there. Guts prepared himself for the fight of his life once again, but he knew he didn't have much time 
time to play around because he could feel it. The sea god was on the move. The people aboard the seahorse saw it too. A massive black dome-shaped dorsal emerging from the cave and collapsing the island it had terrorised for countless eons. It called back all its tentacles and sent a giant wave towards the seahorse which knocked Isidro overboard. Isma, without thinking twice, dove into the ocean to save Isidro and this is where we get another big reveal. The girl was actually Amero herself. Isma might have been a great swimmer but her physical strength was not enough to carry Isidro to the surface. That's when she heard a voice in her head asking her to chant her real name which she did, transforming into Amero and blitzing past the sea god's tentacles to take Isidro to safety. After she had processed the fact that what her father told her about her birth was actually true, Isma dove back into the ocean to go and face the sea god, because the source of the voice she heard had now revealed itself. A school of Meros resurfacing to fend off their ancient enemy. Isma joins their ranks and even reunites with her mother, but that is perhaps the only happy thing that occurs in this whole encounter, because inside the god itself, Guts was struggling harder than ever. The sea god's heart looked a lot like the idea of evil. For those of you who have read chapter 83, massive, fleshy and covered with eyes. These eyes could see Guts trying to slice them apart and so they weaponized the one thing that they were naturally producing, the sea god's heartbeat. Guts managed to rip apart every sea critter holding him down, but he had no answer for the sheer force with which the sea god's heartbeat echoed through his body. His eyes, ears and mouth, everything started to bleed and it was all he could do to even stay conscious. Shirka ended up having to guide him to the heart because he couldn't even take the five steps he needed in order to get there. She wanted Guts to stop, but he knew the sea god was rattled by how fast its heart was beating. The astral duo was stopped in its tracks by the booming pulse, but they received a final respite when Isma, her mother and the rest of the Meros began singing. Their song made the sea god tremble with fear and it negated the effects of its lethal pulse. Guts was able to use his split second opening to strike through the heart and make it fish food. Even dead, the sea god's massive size nearly took the black swordsman with him. Had it not been for the Meros and the Moonlight Boy, Berserk might have ended with this Cthulhu-esque figure, but thankfully our protagonist lived to fight another day. And what's more, he could now claim to be a true god killer. Marvellous verdict. That's it for this one. The Sea God is a great example of how ancient deities were often indifferent to the idea of good or evil. Some of them embody such purely malign concepts that putting them into categories disrespected those categories, and this entity was one of those things. Its head alone is big enough to give any Colosseum a run for its money, and the way it consumes life and assimilates it within itself is all you need to make a good villain great. The Sea God might only have been a part of the series for a cup of coffee, but but his impact will likely be felt until Berserk ends, and you'll see what we mean by that once Studio Gaga resumes publication. Until then, let us know what you think about him in the comments down below, and if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Have a good one, be safe, thanks everyone.